a joy it is for me this evening to join together with each one of you to give thanks to God indeed for his faithfulness in our lives even during these last years. This evening I have uh, I have entitled my talk to you as the rock who never changes in ever changing times. The rock who never changes in ever changing times. The verse that uh, now we have selected for our theme this evening is in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse four, where it says, he is the rock, his works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. He is our rock. Now, now, in a world which is constantly changing, God is the only constant. And this is why Moses here in this passage declares that he is a faithful God. And this is an important word for us today. If you look at the context of this particular verse, you know, Moses is writing this at the end of his life. He is going to hand over charge to Joshua. And this is part of a song that he has written, which people could sing later on to give thanks to God for his goodness and faithfulness. But remember, this was a group that had wandered in the wilderness. That group had perished. It was the next generation that has come back, come in. So Moses is reminding them of who God is, looking back on God's faithfulness of bringing them from Egypt and also looking after them during the period of wandering, even though they were constantly whining against him. So here is the message that Moses is trying to get across to the people. Our God is a faithful God. So when you think of the future, don't give up. When you think of the future, don't get worried. And that's a strong word of assurance for each one of us, even this day. Now, this is the first time that this word rock is used to describe God. And in fact, even in this song itself, you know, Moses speaks about God as a rock as five, in five different ways or five different verses. Now, why does God call himself as a rock? What are some of the characteristics of a rock which is definitely true for God. First of all, a rock is stable. A rock is reliable and trustworthy, isn't it? Our God can be depended upon. A rock is permanent. You know, you find these huge boulders in the sea. And when you think about God, our God is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. When you think about foundations, we put strong rocks when you think about God, he is our sure foundation. He indeed is our firm foundation. And if our lives are built on the rock of Jesus, then we can be sure that no matter whatever storms of life come in, the building will not collapse. The rock is also a place of refuge from the storm. In the midst of a storm, if we are there next to that rock, we would be safe from the storm. That's the imagery of a refuge in the time of our storm. So if you're going through storms in life, even right now, he's our refuge, he's our rock. You know, we can hide in him. And if you're thinking about the future, don't worry, good news for you, storms will come. But the good news is that our God is a rock. He's a faithful one. We can find refuge, we can find shelter, in him. Now, when you're thinking about our God is the faithful God, we are speaking about his character. We are speaking about who he is. It is not the faithfulness of God is not dependent on his moods. It is not dependent on his whims and fancies. It doesn't mean that today God gets up as it were and says, today I'm not going to be faithful. These guys are hopeless guys. No, no. It is true to his nature. And this is why we must have this confidence that our God will never fail us. He is indeed the faithful one. He can be counted upon. 
he is true to his name. He is true to his name. And this is why God is very concerned about the reputation to his name. Remember Moses in the wilderness when the people were you know, griping and whining and God said, I'm going to wipe these guys out. Moses intervened and says, what will happen to your name? What will people say? In Psalm 106 and verse 8, we read, yet he saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty name known. He saved them for his name's sake. When God introduced himself to Moses and Moses wanted to, name, wanted to know, who shall I say has sent me? What did the Lord say was his name? I am, I am the present one. That is his name. He's always there for us. He's true to his name. And as a result, we can be sure that he will always remain faithful. He is also true to his character, true to his character. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, we read, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. The covenant of love. The steadfast love, the Hebrew word that is used there is the hesed, which speaks about one that never fails, one that is constant, one that does not go up and down. It is always there. It is always there. So that's true to his character. We can be sure of his love. We can be sure that he will never stop loving us. And if we have a God who is true to his name, who is true to his character, and was also true to his word because the scripture constantly tells us that he is one who keeps his word. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 1 encourages us, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise you for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. That is God's covenant for us. When you're thinking about a covenant, it is two people who have signed that agreement. And when God says, this is the agreement I've given to you, I will look after you. I've started this work in your life. I've given you this ministry. I'm going to be there with you till the very end. That's a covenant relationship. God is not going to break that covenant. And as a result, we can be sure that our God is indeed a faithful God. So when you're thinking about the faithfulness of God, it goes very deep. God is faithful because he seeks to maintain his reputation. God is faithful because he's true to his character. God is also faithful because he keeps his promises. Now, if this is true of God, and it is true, what are the implications of this for our lives? Yes, in our head, we may believe that God is faithful. But how can we translate it into our hearts and live by that truth that, yes, our God is faithful? What are the implications? Let me share with you a couple of you know, applications or implications. Number one, every word he says is true. Every word he says is true. One of the most important words in the Hebrew is emet, E-M-E-T, which means stability, firmness, or certainty. And we get the English word amen from the Hebrew word emet. So every time we say amen, we are really saying it is certain. Yes, it is absolutely true. Therefore, to say that God is true is the same as saying God is faithful. So every time somebody prays and you say an amen, what are you really saying is, I accept that. I believe that is true. So every time God says something, we are saying amen to that, meaning I accept that what God is saying is true. And where will we find the words of God? <laughs> Definitely in the Bible, isn't it? God has given us an entire book filled with his words. So if God has given us his words, which we can count on, which we can say amen to it, our responsibility then is to read the book, study it, memorize it, learn it, build upon it. 
And our responsibility is the more we read God's word, imbibe its truths into our minds, say amen to it, not in our head, but in our hearts to acknowledge, yes, I believe what God has said in his word is true, then our lives are going to definitely change. Second implication is that every promise will be kept. Every promise will be kept. Because God is faithful, he keeps every promise that he makes. And has he made any promises in the Bible? Definitely. Plenty of promises, isn't it? And it's high time we spend time understanding those promises, first of all, because each promise has a condition attached to it. We don't take a promise out of context, but we understand those promises. We believe that these promises are spoken to us by God, and we believe that he will definitely keep his promises. Look at Joshua chapter 21. Now, if Moses wrote this in Deuteronomy at the end of his life, Joshua at the end of his life, in Joshua 21, verses 43 to 45, this is what it reads. It says, so the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. <laughs> Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. What a grand statement, isn't it? But if we really go back and study the book of Joshua carefully, we would see how God kept his promises. It, doesn't, it didn't happen immediately. It took a long time. It took around seven years. It didn't happen without a struggle. There were plenty of battles that they had to face. It didn't happen without any failures along the way. There were definitely the sin of Archon that is mentioned in Joshua chapter 7. It didn't happen without any loss of life. But what God said, he did. No one could have said in advance how it would happen. But in the end, the Israelites were totally victorious. And that's the assurance for us. God keeps his promises. How he's going to keep it, we do not know. The end, we do not know. But the fact remains that he is a God who keeps his promises, and we can be sure of that. The story is told of Gladys Alwar, the missionary who served in China before World War II. And when the Japanese army invaded northern China, she was forced to flee this place along with a hundred orphans. And as she led the orphans into the mountains, she despaired of ever making it to safety. After a sleepless night, she was reminded by a 13-year-old girl of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. Now, here's a young girl speaking to a senior missionary and saying, remember, God delivered the children of Israel, Red Sea parted. We can trust God, isn't it? God will deliver us. Now to this, Gladys Alward responded and said, but I'm not Moses. And the little girl replied and said, of course you aren't, but Jehovah is still God. Jehovah is still God. Is not that a word for us today? No matter whatever mountains may loom over us, no matter whatever storms may come around us, our God is still God and we can definitely trust him. So this evening, if you're feeling squeezed in by your circumstances, think not about the storm. Think not about the mountain. Think about the promises of God. Read them, write it down, memorize them, put it where you can see it all the time, and hold on to these promises. Because not only is every word true and every promise kept, God is definitely a faithful God. But now you may tell me, you know, but life has been difficult. Last couple of years, it has been so much of stress and strain and trials, you know. But remember, thirdly, every trial has a purpose. Every trial has a purpose. Oftentimes, when trials come into our lives, we think that God has forgotten us. Or we think that something we have done wrong, so God is angry with us. No, no. God is not angry in that sense. He is one who is still a faithful God. He takes us through those trials of life. He is with us in the midst of the trials of life. And as Job in 23 and 10 says, he knows the way that I take. 
when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. That's the confidence of Job. Job is saying, God, I know you are a faithful God. Yes, I'm going through these trials and testings right now. Remember that what trials that Job went through, none of us have ever gone through, isn't it? And I hope and pray we won't go through such trials. But Job has gone through such intense trials. And in the midst of that, his confidence level in God is that he knows the way that I take. Meaning that I know he's a faithful God. He's taking me through these trials. When I come out, I will definitely come forth as gold. The story is told of a little boy who was fine, flying a kite in the sky when it drifted into the clouds and disappeared from view. A passerby asked the little boy what he was doing. He said, I'm flying my kite. Now the man looking up and seeing only the cloud said, I don't see any kite. How do you know it is still there? I don't see it either, replied the boy. But I know it is up there because once in a while, there's a tug on my string. Once in a while, there is a tug in my on my string. Now, there may be times in our lives when we feel God is abandoned, God is silent, we don't see the hand of God. But remember, there is still that little tug in your heart, that little tug which will still say, our God is still faithful. Our God is still faithful. So keep holding on. He is faithful when we cannot see his presence. Hold on. And sooner or later, you will definitely feel the tug on the line. Fourthly, our God is faithful in providing for us. I'm sure you can, each one of us can give a testimony of how God has met our needs during these last couple of years. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 says, my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory. Now there may be seasons in our life, some people call this as the dark night of our soul, when individuals will have these questions, how will I make it? How will I survive? And you may have felt yourself stretched financially, stretched emotionally, stretched spiritually during these past years. But I'm sure looking back, you can say even this evening, as we give thanks to God for his faithfulness, I thank you, God, that you met all my needs. Fifthly, God is faithful to uplift and encourage us. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 tells us that he who has started the good work will continue to complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. That's the assurance. If he has started it, he doesn't leave any job half done. He is going to complete it. When? Till we meet him face to face or till he comes back again to take us home. That's the assurance. Our God is a faithful God. He lifts us up. He has started. He will finish it. Our God is faithful. Sixthly, our God is faithful in comforting us, in comforting us. The scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. During these last years, maybe some of us are lost, lost our loved ones, you know, Comfort was there? Definitely. Who comforted it? The human comfort may not last for a long time, but the comfort that God gives to us is that which will last forever. God's comfort restores us, revives our broken spirit, and God assures us of that, isn't it? God promises in his word that he will definitely comfort us so that we in turn can comfort others who go through those same struggles. Seventhly, God is faithful in strengthening us, in strengthening us. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the famous passage where Paul has pleaded and asked God, God, remove this thorn in my flesh, remove this thorn in my flesh. He's been struggling and struggling and struggling. Does God answer his prayer? In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Lord says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the message from God to him. You have been asking me to take this off, but I'm asking, telling you in the midst of this, my grace is sufficient. So his response to that is, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power 
may rest on me. Thank God for his faithful grace. If it was not for the grace of God, we would have been lost, deserted, abandoned long ago. But it is God's grace, God's faithfulness that continues to take us on. His power is made perfect in our weakness. He will strengthen us for specific assignments and tasks that he gives to us for the journey ahead. When you think of the journey ahead, it may seem dark, it may seem bleak, but God is faithful. He will definitely give us the strength for the future. When you are weary, God will give you rest. But our first thought has to be, Lord, I'm going to depend on you because you indeed are a faithful God. And number eight, God is faithful in giving us a community. It's not just that God is faithful, but he gives us people together who can support us in our assurance that God is faithful. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the writer says, do not forsake the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. God has given us the body of believers so that we can encourage one another. We can encourage one another with the truths of this word that our God is faithful. Don't give up. Don't give up. Hold on to him. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of the struggles, our God is there. And God has given us this body so that we can hold on and support one another. When you feel like no one understands and you are alone, God provides this fellowship. That is why don't stop coming for fellowships because life is tough, because you're going through struggles. Come for fellowship because that is the time you will be able to be strengthened. But remember, above all, God is our ultimate source of support. We must seek God's word daily for wisdom and direction. God is faithful when life isn't fair. When you want to throw in the towel and saying, too much for me, remember God will still lift you up, comfort you, strengthen you. Your immediate circumstances may not change, but be confident that God will provide you all that you need to persevere. Be grateful that our God is faithful. Let me close with this uh, now, illustration. The story is told of a person by the name of Roger Sims, who was hitchhiking his way home. After leaving the army, he was going home and his heavy suitcase made Roger very tired. He was anxious to take off his army uniform once and for all. And flashing the hitchhiking sign to the oncoming car, he lost hope when he saw that it was a black, sleek, new Cadillac. And to his surprise, the car stopped. The passenger door opened. He ran towards the car, tossed his suitcase in the back, thanked the handsome, well-dressed man as he slid into the front seat. Going home for keeps, the man asked. Sure am, Roger replied. The man said, well, you're in luck if you're going to Chicago. And Roger replied and said, not quite that far. Do you live in Chicago? He says, yes, I have business there, and my name is Hanover. Now, after talking about many things, Roger, who was a Christian, felt a compulsion in his heart to witness to this 50-ish year old, apparently successful businessman about Christ. But he kept putting it off till he realized that he was just 30 minutes away from his home. It was now or never. So Roger cleared his throat and said, Mr. Hanover, I would like to talk to you about something very important. He then proceeded to explain the way of salvation, ultimately asking Mr. Hanover if he would like to receive Christ as his savior. And to Roger's astonishment, the Cadillac pulled over to the side of the road. Now, Roger thought that he was going to be thrown out of the car, but the businessman bowed his head and received Christ. Then he thanked Roger. This is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. Five years went by. Roger got married. He had a two-year-old boy and a business of his own. And packing his suitcase for a business trip to Chicago, he found that small white business card that Hanover had given to him five years ago. And in Chicago, he looked up Hanover Enterprises. A receptionist told him that it was impossible to see Mr. Hanover, but he could see Mrs. Hanover. 
He was a little confused about what was going on as he was ushered into a lovely office and found himself facing a keen-eyed woman in her 50s. She extended her hand and asked him, you knew my husband? Roger then told her husband how, told her how her husband had given him a ride when hitchhiking home after the war. Can you tell me when it was, she said. It was May 7th, five years ago, the day I was discharged, for, discharged from the army. Anything special about that day? The woman asked, the wife asked rather. Roger hesitated. Should he mention giving his witness? Since he had come so far, he said, might as well take the plunge. So he told her, Mrs. Hanover, I explained the gospel. He pulled over to the side of the road and wept against the steering wheel. He gave his life to Christ that day. Explosive sobs. She started weeping profusely. Explosive sobs shook her body. Getting a grip on herself, she sobbed profusely and said, I prayed for my husband's salvation for years. I believed God would save him. So Roger asked, where's your husband, Mrs. Hanover? He's dead. She wept bitterly as she struggled with her words. He was in a car crash after he left you, after he let you out of the car. He never got home. You see, I thought God had not kept his promise. Sobbing uncontrollably, she added, I stopped living for God five years ago because I thought he had not kept his word. I wonder if I'm speaking to someone today who has maybe given up on God, who has said God has not kept his promise. I prayed for so-and-so and that person died. I prayed for healing and God, did answer, God didn't answer. I wonder if you're going through those frustrations and have given up on God. Let me encourage you this evening. Don't give up. Our God is a faithful God. Even in that extreme case, God was faithful and he will be faithful to us too. Rest in him. Trust him. Serve him. He is who he claims to be and he will do all that he has promised. He indeed is the faithful God. Let's bow our heads in prayer together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed such a good God, such a faithful God, one who never abandons us. Whatever we go through, we can be sure of this, that you are with us. Father, we pray that you'd help this knowledge about the faithful God to move from our head to our hearts, that we would live with this assurance daily, yielding ourselves to you, trusting you fully, and seeing you taking us one step at a time into all that you have in store for us. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.